welcome to the keynote podcast from Kingdom Faith. Today's message is by Pastor Colin Urquhart. Amen. Let's be seated. I'm going to talk a bit about worship this morning, which is why we we'll leave the main worship until after the word. If you want to turn to Luke chapter 7. Pharisee invited Jesus to his home for dinner. While reclining at the table, a woman with a sinful past from that town who had heard where Jesus was eat, eating entered the house carrying an alabaster jar of expensive perfume. She stood behind Jesus and then knelt weeping at his feet. When her tears fell on his feet, she wiped them with her hair, then kissed them and poured the perfume on them. When the host Pharisee saw this, he thought, if this man was really a prophet, he would know what kind of a sinful woman this is that is touching him. Jesus said to him, Simon, I have a personal word for you. What is it, teacher, he asked. Two men owed money to a particular moneylender. One owed him 500, the other 50. But neither was able to repay him. So he cancelled both their debts. Now, which of the two will have the greater love for him? Simon answered, I suppose the one with the larger debt that was cancelled. You have answered correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned towards the woman and said to Simon the Pharisee, Do you see this woman? When I came into your house, you failed to give me any water to wash my feet. Yet this woman has washed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a welcoming embrace, but from the time I arrived, this woman has not stopped kissing my feet. You didn't anoint my head with fragrant oil, but she has poured expensive perfume on my feet. So I tell you clearly, the many sins of which she was guilty have all been forgiven. For she has shown such great love for me. But the one who has only been forgiven superficially will only love superficially. Then Jesus said to the woman, Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. But the other guests murmured, Who does he think he is to forgive sins? Then Jesus traveled around proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom in every town and village. He was accompanied by the twelve disciples and a group of women who had been healed and set free from demonic spirits. There's a lot of focus on the twelve disciples, but not so much on the other group that followed him wherever he went. The women who supported Jesus and the disciples out of their own income, goes on to say. But there's a group of women who have been healed and set free from demonic powers. Simon the Pharisee had not extended to Jesus the usual courtesies for a guest, which is perhaps surprising, but nevertheless that's the case. And this woman completely upstages him. I remember some years ago, it's just quite a few years ago now, when God spoke to us about worship and how he wanted to do a new thing in our worship and told us that 
he would teach us really what it was to worship in the spirit if we stopped doing what we were doing, which was singing songs and having somebody lead and so on. Not many of you were around at that time. Of course, it led to a really tremendous move of the spirit in worship, which went on for a few years, actually. Sometimes I think songs, rather than being a vehicle of worship, can prevent us from worshipping. For this woman, there were no songs, not even any words. But there was adoration. There was real worship. She was pouring something out of her heart. And Jesus, of course, was well aware of that. Using this precious ointment was a sign of love that she was giving perhaps what to her was the only thing she could give. And the most precious thing to her that she had to give. And Jesus would have been aware of all of that. And it's so easy, isn't it, for us to be so used to doing things, even worshipping, that every now and again it's good just to stop and think, well, what's it all about? Am I really kissing the feet of Jesus? Am I really worshipping at his footstool? We can direct songs to the Lord, but am I really coming before the Lord? When I worship him, am I really touching him? Because if I touch him, he will surely touch me. And so the worship becomes not just a kissing of his feet, but a kind of embrace with the Lord. Because it is all about Jesus, isn't it? And if you read in Psalm 27, my heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, will I seek. Feet, face, head to toe. The focus is on Jesus. I wonder when we worship whether we're really seeking his face <coughs> or just directing words in our own language and the spirit sort of towards his throne, whatever that means. One of the most blessed things that Jesus ever said, he said to this woman, a threefold blessing. <coughs> Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. That's what it's all about, isn't it? <laughs> and what Jesus was teaching Simon and, of course, the others who were there, the disciples among them, 
is that before faith in Jesus, your previous lifestyle is of absolutely no account. Whether this woman was a prostitute, whatever she was, was irrelevant once her sins were forgiven. We had former prostitutes in the church in Luton. We had former prostitutes in the community at the Hyde. I don't know if we've got former prostitutes in the church now. I don't know enough about the people in the church to be able to answer that. But <clears throat> I was probably the only one that knew they had been prostitutes. Not even Caroline would know because anything I knew in confidence, of course, I couldn't even tell her because that would be to break the confidence. And th that was good that nobody would even be aware of their former lifestyle. That once they had repented, whatever had been no longer existed. This forgiveness of sins is the eradication of the record of those sins. The um, faith has saved them from what they were. Yes. Their faith in Jesus has given them the salvation which has made them new. And if you have been made new, then your former life is of no account. That life you had is dead, buried with Christ. And we know that's what our water baptism signifies. We are made new. Yes. Completely. Come on. We're not an improved version of what we were. But we are a new creation. And that is true even of the prostitute. It was true of those that had been bound and used and manipulated by demonic spirits. It was true, therefore, of those who belonged to the devil. In one sense, everybody does before they're born again. But those who perhaps serve the devil and even worship the devil... All that is of no account once a person has been saved. Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Peace comes from the knowledge of the first two things that your sins are forgiven and your faith has saved you. Now we know it's all the grace of God, the mercy that forgives, the grace that saves. But it's knowing that that inspires our worship. An interesting, very interesting question you see that Jesus puts to Simon and very interesting illustration. Even suggesting that those who are forgiven much will therefore love the more. <clears throat> they will be so pleased to be saved from what they were their love for Jesus would be so much greater than those perhaps brought up in a Christian home with a Christian background who hardly know what it was to be saved. 
they weren't saved from a completely alien lifestyle. They weren't saved from a demonic background. They weren't saved from a disastrous lifestyle. But those that have me, Jesus suggests, will love them all. So <coughs> pleased, so delighted to be saved. The important thing is, of course, that Jesus never taught supporting people in their problems, but delivering them from the lifestyle that they have lived so that they are made completely new. And of course we know that that comes from repentance and faith. So why are the sins forgiven? Because of the repentance of sin. Why has the salvation taken place? Because of the faith that Jesus Christ is the Son of God who gave his life that we might be made one with God now and eternally. All the basic truths of the gospel. If we lose sight of them, we lose sight of what worship's about. And worship can become just something we do rather than this kissing of his feet, this seeking of his face. It is a matter of love, isn't it? <clears throat> if you're married, you have probably kissed the feet of your beloved one at times. But you don't go around kissing everybody else's feet. It's a very intimate kind of thing, isn't it? Especially if you wash the feet of your beloved with tears and then some of us would have a problem drying them with our hair, but... <laughs> you get the point. Something so desperately intimate and uh, isn't that what worship is supposed to be about beyond words even beyond tongues adoration it's not a word <clears throat> we hear very often these days Because you don't go around saying to a lot of people, I adore you. I love you. Yeah, that's commonly said, but not I adore you. And rightly so, because you save adoration for particular people. But when it comes to the Lord, he is worthy of our adoration. all the time and that adoration speaks of this intimacy but at the same time it gives birth to disciples I'm constantly aware, as I'm sure you are, that, of this great commission to make disciples. And as you read the Gospels and you see what Jesus meant by a disciple, you realize that it is a complete lifestyle. 
you can't be a disciple for a certain number of hours a week or because you actually do certain things. It is a lifestyle. It's, it's a way of life. But it's based on following Jesus. It's based on this relationship with Jesus, this adoration of Jesus, this exalting of Jesus, this face to face seeking of Jesus. And I speak to myself as well as you because I know that every now and again I, I have to take stock of where I am in terms of worship and what is going on, what is happening in times of worship. It is so easy to do it as a function and, you know, to do that from the heart. I'm not suggesting that it's mechanical or anything like that. And yet, not quite to be hitting the spot. Not really to be washing his feet. Not really adoring him. Not really enjoying those moments of intimacy with him where something is happening between us that couldn't happen outside of that relationship. On Sunday I'm due to be talking about belonging and I could easily preach a sermon about belonging. You could preach a sermon about belonging. But I just had the sense that God wants to do something different in the sense of showing us something different about what it really means to belong to him and to one another. So it'll be interesting because that's a work in process. Uh, So it'll be interesting to see where we get to by Sunday on that one. But uh, your sins are forgiven you. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And I've been actually li- living with this particular scripture the last few days, and, and um, it's new every day. You see, every day your sins are forgiven. Every day God has saved you. I mean, you know, it's this ongoing process of salvation. And every day we can go in peace because we are forgiven, because of his saving grace that's at work in our lives. How great. And one of the things that I quite often say to people that I'm seeking to help are just two words. He knows. I think so much prayer is a waste of time because people are telling God what he knows. He doesn't need you to tell him what he knows. He does know what he knows without you telling him what he knows. But he knows. He knows about the sin. He knows when the sin is forgiven. He knows, therefore, when that sin no longer exists. He knows about his saving grace. 
He knows about how that saving grace needs to be reflected, expressed in your life day by day. And he knows when it is. When you're actually walking and living in the confidence, the boldness of one who knows he is saved. And is not listening to that condemning voice of the enemy, seeking to undermine confidence. I've had a real thing going with the Lord the last few days about confidence. Because you know when you get battered with criticism and all kinds of things, it can affect your confidence. And God just brought me up short the other day and he said, Colin, your confidence has been undermined without you realizing it. You know, when things come against you, come against you, come against you, and you're conscious of them all the time, you don't realize necessarily that your confidence is actually taking a battering because you're sort of taking the shield of faith and you're rising up against it. But confidence enables us to progress, to move forward, to advance. Where did this woman get her confidence from? I mean, it must have must have taken something for a woman like this to come into a situation like that and publicly do for Jesus what, what she was doing. It wasn't the washing of the feet that forgave the sins. Her sins were already forgiven. Jesus had said that to Simon. He said, her sins are forgiven. So she wasn't forgiven just when Jesus said your sins are forgiven. He was just saying, well, look, this has happened. And God is our confidence, isn't he? But what I found over the years is that your confidence doesn't come just by saying, well, I must be more confident. Your confidence comes from adoring him. From those face-to-face -face encounters with him. You know, he, he's with us always, isn't he? He's, he's always there. Confidence is trusting him, isn't it? Not trusting yourself. But we can do that in a defensive way. But God wants us have, to have the, the confidence to be offensive as well as defensive. Powerful people take hold of the kingdom. Powerful people can be used by God to extend the kingdom. And it's as if, you see, why, why does Jesus say these three things to this woman? It's like he's saying to her, look, you're washing my feet because you know your sins are forgiven. You know you have a new life now. Don't worry about all these other guys. Don't worry about Simon. Don't worry about these other Pharisees. Don't worry about what they're saying about you. Don't worry about the fact that they're looking at what you were. I'm only looking at what you are. And I welcome you to wash my feet. Because your confidence comes from knowing who you are, not who you were. So it's like he's saying, never mind what they're thinking, never mind what they're saying. Was this woman one of those who was among that group that followed Jesus? We don't know, it doesn't actually say that. But whether she wasn't or not, she followed him from that day on, you can be sure of that. 
Your confidence comes from knowing, yes, you're saved from, from what you were. You're saved from everything that has damaged you, been inflicted upon you, everything that you've done to inflict damage on others. You're saved from all that. Your faith in me has saved you. So it's like saying to her, well, never mind their judgment of you. You are saved by your faith in me. It's like Jesus was saying, you're the only one here that's kissing my feet. They're standing around in judgment of you, but you're kissing my feet. You're washing my feet with your tears. They're criticizing you for adoring me, for worshiping me. Never mind them. Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. A peace that her detractors, her judges, those around her didn't have. It's the peace that comes from knowing you're forgiven, saved. Peace that comes out of that place of adoration, of real worship. And, and lastly, the sweet perfume. What is the sweet perfume? Well, the sweet perfume that we have is the Holy Spirit, isn't it? That we worship in spirit. And in truth. Could it be then that the Spirit takes us to the feet of Jesus? Could it be that the the Spirit moves in us and says, Seek his face? What does that mean? Look at the glory. Focus on the glory. He is the spirit of glory. Peter says the spirit of God and of his glory is upon you. So when we worship in spirit... He wants there to be a revelation of glory. I, I read something a little while ago that really got me thinking. I can't remember who it was now. It's one, one of the revivalists, because they're about the only people that I read, actually, apart from the scriptures. But one of them said, it is so easy to worship his presence rather than to worship him. that, you know, people think they have arrived in the worship and there's a sense of his presence. And the point he was making is, when there's a sense of his presence, that isn't the worship. But that means he is present to be worshipped. I think, you know, so often there's a sense of his presence and we think we've arrived. And, and uh, the writer, the point he was really making is, no, when there's a sense of his presence, that's when the worship can begin. Because what we have done 
is to draw near to the throne. We've come near to him. We've come into his presence, if you like. So now the worship can start. But just knowing that sense of his presence isn't the worship. I can remember, I, I suppose really, it's something I learned many, many years ago because there was a time when as soon as I got into the presence, I thought, oh, good, that's it, God's around. I can get up and get on, go and get on with stuff now. And it took a while for God just to teach me, wait a minute, wait a minute. Just having that sense of my presence means I want you to stay in my presence, abide in me. Just rest in me. Just have fellowship with me in that place of intimacy. I don't want you just to know my presence and go rushing off to do something else. Of course, we take his presence into whatever we're doing, but it's those quality times. And activity is always our enemy, isn't it? You know, we have to be active, but the activity comes out of the relationship. It doesn't replace the relationship. That's the important thing. I mean, uh, we're not passive. We're active people if we're people of faith. But the activity comes out of our encounters with God, not replacing the encounter or thinking the encounters don't matter because we're being active. So it's interesting this because actually what I'm talking about this morning is what it means to belong <laughs> to him. And our belonging to one another comes out of our belonging to him, obviously. And, you know, this sense of belonging, that's the first point, isn't it, of our sevenfold covenant with one another you belong to me I belong to you because that's what covenant with God is all about you belong to me I belong to you yeah. you are my people I am your God it's all that sense of belonging <coughs> so we adore the one to whom we belong <laughs> And, and I guess really, if we can talk about him in this way, the Lord rather enjoys that. The Lord loves obedience, doesn't he? Thank you for your enthusiasm there. But he does love obedience, if you haven't realized that. He does love obedience. That he has a particular love for the obedient. I, I, I did a, a thing with the students, I think it was the second year students. We had, a, in, in the direct counselling thing, we had a very interesting time. Does God love everybody equally? And of course, scripturally, the answer to that is clearly no, he doesn't. But everybody thinks that he does. And the student's first reaction was, yes, well, of course he does. But he doesn't. He has love for everybody, but he has a particular love for his children, and he has a particular, particular love for his obedient children. And if you look at Scripture, you will see that that is true. And Jesus himself says it clearly. John 15, and he's talking about abiding in him. And fulfilling that commandment to love. That if we obey him, he will love us just as the Father loved him because he obeyed the Father. Jesus says it clearly. So there must be a particular love that comes out of that obedience 
And I guess, therefore, that it, it, it doesn't mean that, that there are people God doesn't love. He loves everybody. But Jesus had a variety of relationships, didn't he? He had his love for the crowd. He had his love for the twelve. He had his love for the three. He had a particular love for John. He had a particular love for Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. He didn't love everybody the same way. Because <clears throat> love is about relationship. The closer you are to the Lord, the more you abide in his love. The more that love can be expressed in your life. Does he love the sinner? Yes. Does he love the sin? No. But if he hates sin, then more of his love is going to be expressed in the one who is forgiven than the one who is living in disobedience. What hit this woman Presumably before this event, otherwise the event wouldn't have taken place, was the love of Jesus and the acceptance of Jesus. I mean, let's face it, even though not everybody believed that he was the Son of God or the Messiah, Jesus was a holy man. To the masses of people. Jesus was a healer. Jesus was a rabbi, even a rabbi was worthy of honor and respect. But he was no ordinary rabbi, was he? And yet, this is what we see. All these really needy, desperate people were there in the crowd when Jesus preached because his love attracted them. His holiness did not condemn them. That's what gave this woman the freedom to come and kiss his feet and to worship at his feet. This love, see, God wants to reveal more and more of his love, isn't he? He's just drawing us, drawing us deeper and deeper and deeper into his love. Why? Because he knows that the more deeply he draws us into his love, the more of that love will be expressed to others. I'm not suggesting, you see, that God sits on his throne deciding that he will love some more than others. It's just that the more deep, the, the more fully we respond to that love, the more deeply he is able to express that love towards us, in us, through us. And, and this is really what I believe God is saying to us this morning that if worship isn't about love, what is it about? And if our worship doesn't come out of love, what does it come out of? There's a work to be done here, isn't there? Because, you know, I'm sure if people appreciated that, nobody would be late for the time of worship on a Sunday or at any other time. But one suspects, I mean one tries not to judge, but one suspects that the attitude of a few could be, possibly, oh well we've only missed the worship. But to me that's the most important part of the whole thing, isn't it? So the word comes out of the worship. The moving of God's spirit comes out of the worship. 
all comes out of this embrace of love. This kissing of his feet, this washing his feet with our tears even. Adoration. Not tears of sorrow and repentance, but tears of love. I just love you so much, Lord. But Jesus says it. Those who are forgiven much. Love much. <clears throat> Let's worship him, shall we? Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources by Kingdom Faith and for our other audio and video podcasts, please visit kingdomfaith.com.